Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, who then are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Thank you, Spencer. Oh, so good to be here. You know, it's interesting. I feel sick, my voice, I'm worried it's going to give out, and then I kind of forgot that as I was worshiping. I was singing like I was at a concert, so that was fun. Please stay in John chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 19. The way we usually do this is we read a little, we talk a little, we read a little, and then we go grab lunch. Hallelujah and amen. All right? And so here we are in this series called In Jesus' Name, Amen. We're going verse by verse, in some cases, word by word through the book of John. This book that was written by John the Apostle, John the Disciple whom Jesus loves. And he, in the first 18 verses, was essentially doing his thesis statement. He was doing the prologue of what this entire book is going to be about, that it's all about Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished, and that we can have life in his name because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I think that there's probably a misunderstanding in every faith, in every type of faith, especially if you don't practice that faith, there's probably a bunch of misunderstandings that you have. But when it comes to Christianity, I am sure there are more misunderstandings than we even realize. If you've been here in the past eight months, you probably heard at least once or maybe 32 times that we believe that the Bible are actually the very words of God. That we believe that God spoke through the word and that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, which we studied in particular last week. I just don't want anyone to think that we can worship a God that we create in our own mind that is subjective. And I want us to trust and believe the very words that God said about himself. Because when we do, we, if we are believing in a God that we've made up in our mind, we're starting to trust in a God that is subjective, we start to have what I would say is a placebo faith. One that equates more to a hobby or a pastime rather than a lifestyle of worship to the one true God. So today, as we continue our series, in Jesus' name, amen, a study through the book of John, I want us to not misunderstand who this Jesus is. I want us to not misunderstand what Christians are. When it comes to being misunderstood, prophets of both the Old and, as we're going to look at today, the New Testaments, seem, prophets seem to be the ones who took the cake when it came to being misunderstood having misconceptions applied to them in their culture. So John chapter 1, verse 19, here's what it says. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. So you've got John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's the author of this book, but he's writing about John the Baptist. And so usually when I talk about John, I'll either call him John the author or John the disciple whom Jesus loved, or I'll say John the Baptist if we're talking about who John is talking about. Anyone confused? Fantastic. John the Baptist testimony, again, is being written down by John the author, the author of the book of John. 
And John the author uses a term here for Jewish leaders that really implies unbelieving Jews because the emphasis is that they do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they misunderstand and have misconceptions of who the Messiah will be, what he will do, and what he will look like. Often when the author John speaks of Jews who follow and believe, he doesn't say Jews, he says Israel or Israel, which is a symbol and expression of God's people. That's what Israel represents. And the priests and the Levites who took care of the temple were sent to talk to John the Baptist or John the Baptizer to figure out who John the Baptist was. For 400 years, God had seemed quiet because there was nothing that, no prophets that spoke on his behalf that were legitimate. Scripture had not been written up until the end of Malachi. That was the last time anyone had heard from God. But now this man who seemed to speak with the authority of God was baptizing and telling people that they needed to repent of their sin and that forgiveness was available. So they wanted to know who John the Baptist was. And they asked a pretty good question. Who are you? But really, they wanted to know if he was the Messiah, if he was the one that the scriptures had talked about. Verse 20, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. It's not that incredible that these Levites and priests would think that maybe John was the Messiah. There were many people in this time period before even him that had claimed that they were the Messiah that they were the anointed one. But over and over, it had been proven false. It wasn't until a man who claimed to be God rose from the dead. Spoiler alert. We'll talk more about that on Easter. That a Messiah was actually proven to be the real deal. Verse 21. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Can you imagine this exchange? How frustrating is this? He's just answering the questions they ask. They're like, come on, we want to know who you are. And asking John if he were Elijah was actually a great question. It explained how much they knew about the Old Testament, how much they knew about the Hebrew scriptures. But then they started to realize maybe John was the precursor to the Messiah, and that's why they asked him if he was Elijah. And Elijah was a great prophet, who did not actually physically die, but according to 2 Kings chapter 2, he was taken up in a whirlwind to heaven. Anyone want to do that? That just sounds awesome. And Malachi had prophesied at the end of what is known as the Old Testament. This is the drop the mic end of the Old Testament. He says in chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, Malachi says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you. He's speaking for God. Before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So now you have John the Baptist who's come not as Elijah incarnate. He didn't come back down and put on a John the Baptist get up, but he's come in the same spirit as Elijah, a prophet who wanted to see people repent of their wickedness, turn from their wickedness, and turn to the Lord God Almighty for reconciliation. And they ask, well, if you're not Elijah, are you the prophet? And yet again, he says no. But this is in reference to Deuteronomy 18. In the Hebrew Scriptures, we're in Deuteronomy 18. It says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your fellow uh, Israelites, I was going to say Israel, I can't do it. You must listen to him, for this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Oreb on the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. And once again, the teachers of the law thought they were right, that they had cracked the code, if you will, and interpreted the scriptures correctly. But yet again, they had a misconception. They misunderstood who this person in Deuteronomy was talking about, that this person was going to come and speak on God's behalf. It wasn't John the Baptist. He was just a foreshadowing like all the other prophets of the Old Testament, 
The prophet being spoken about was the actual Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus the Christ, King Jesus King. Verse 22 of John. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? At this point, I wonder, as they're going back and forth, if they're frustrated with John because he hasn't actually revealed who he was. But then he says this in verse 23. From the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. John did not exalt himself as anyone other than a voice who is being used to prepare the way for the Lord. I don't want you guys to miss this. John the Baptist did not exalt himself, and he sure as heck could have. He quotes another prophet, Isaiah, who says, this is Isaiah 40, verse 3, a voice of one calling in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. In the original context of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, the prophet heard a voice calling for essentially a leveling of a path through the eastern desert so that the God of Israel could lead his people from Babylonian exile. This call was a prophetic picture that foreshadowed the final and greatest return of Israel to their God from spiritual darkness and alienation through the spiritual redemption that's only accomplished by this Messiah. That's why these questions are being asked of John, because this is so important. But in humility, church, and I know humility is a hard thing to grasp sometimes. In humility, John compared himself to a voice rather than a person thus focusing all of the attention exclusively upon Christ. Verse 24. Now the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, who had been sent, questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? So they're hearing this conversation. Priests and Levites are asking questions, and now you have the Pharisees that always just want to throw some rocks from behind the cross, don't they? And they want to ask some questions. And since John had identified himself as a mere voice, the question arose as to his authority for baptizing. The Old Testament, the left part of our Bible, associated the coming of Messiah with repentance, changing direction, and spiritual cleansing. But John focused his attention on his position as a forerunner of the Messiah, who used traditional baptism as a symbol of the need to recognize Jews who were outside of God's saving covenant, just like the Gentiles. They too needed spiritual cleansing and preparation. And John would baptize for the forgiveness of sins, which was also a foreshadowing of Christian baptism, wasn't it? Which represents our baptism. If you've been baptized, if you've gone underneath water and come out of water, if you have been immersed with water in Jesus' name, it is to identify yourself with Jesus. That's what baptism is. To identify yourself with Jesus' perfect life, his death, and his resurrection, which is our only means of justification and right standing before God. So let me make it simple. You can't work your way to God. Sorry to let you know that. Verse 26. John's replying to these Pharisees, and he says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. I baptize, this is what he's saying essentially, I baptize as a symbol of cleansing, but there is one that is here that you do not recognize who's going to do far greater things. Verse 27, he is the one who comes after me, and the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. And John the Baptist's words here continue a theme of preeminence about the Messiah in the prologue of the first 18 verses. The last two sermons we've done have been about John chapter 1 verses 1 through 18. And what John is demonstrating is extraordinary humility. Each time John had the opportunity to focus on himself, In these encounters, he instead shifted all of the focus onto the Messiah. John went so so far as to state that he, even unlike a slave that was required to remove the master's shoes, he was not worthy of performing this action because in relationship to the Messiah and how perfect the Messiah is. A misunderstanding of Christianity, let's just get practical right now, 
A misunderstanding of Christianity is this holier-than-thou mentality. You guys know what I'm talking about? If you don't, you might be doing it and you don't even realize it. It's one where we either act as if we've had it all, we got it all figured out, which we don't, or that we've earned our salvation, which we can't. Too often, we start to point to an event or to some actions that we did in the past or titles that we carried in the past. Well, I was the Bible study leader. I led this group. And we point to these things as our justification. And John exhibited what it means to be about Jesus. He could have explained how wonderful he was. In fact, Luke writes about John the Baptist and says he's the greatest person other than Jesus. He's the greatest person born naturally. He's the greatest person that wasn't God, essentially. He could have talked about how wonderful he was. All that he had to do, he could have explained all that he had accomplished. He could have said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm Elijah. Oh, you think I'm the Messiah? Okay. But he didn't do that. He didn't buy into them trying to put titles onto him that were not His, but instead, his sole purpose was to be a voice to tell and illuminate to others the one who would come. I've said this before, but a proud Christian is an oxymoron. You guys hear what I'm saying? A proud Christian is an oxymoron. Did you just say I'm a moron? Yes. A proud Christian is an oxymoron. And you... Okay. Okay. When we come into the presence of God at the end of this life, but really when we come into the presence of the Lord understanding that we're justified by Jesus, none of us get to come to God with our heads held high. You guys picking up what I'm putting down? None of us get to come to God and say, hey, we did something to earn this. No. We do not go into the kingdom of God with our head held high. We come with scratched and beaten up knees as we crawl into his presence because we don't deserve to be there. But God is so good that he gave us his son. You didn't do a thing. Hear me, you didn't clean yourself up. You didn't get your act together so he'd want you. He wanted you because of his grace. He wanted you because of his goodness. Not because of anything that you would accomplish for him. Sometimes, especially when we've been in ministry, and I can testify to this, we start to act like God's lucky to have us. Uh Uh-uh. No way. So we, like John, come knowing that we are just a voice to testify of his grace, his goodness, and his glory. Not our own. Anyone ever told you um, something negative about Christians? Okay, just making sure. (laughs) This isn't just like a me thing at Pete's Coffee? Okay. (laughs) And whenever someone comes to me and they're argumentative and they're negative about Christians, you know what I don't do? I don't argue. Because it's through his grace to a beat up, tore up, from the floor up sinner that he gets made much of. It's the fact that he would give grace to a wretch like me. It is that he shows off how loving and patient and powerful and beautiful he is to redeem a sinner like me and like you. So next time someone comes to you and says, Christians are hypocrites, you go, yep, we meet on Sundays. (laughs) Or they say, Christians are mean, or Christians are close-minded, or don't try to argue with them. Jesus juked them. You guys, nothing? Okay, that was for my, that was my generation. We Jesus juke. Someone's like, They sneeze. Oh, God bless you. So about God. Like you always just kind of bring God up into the conversation. That's a Jesus joke. But when someone starts to explain how terrible Christians are, you go, man, I I understand. Now, you know that they're really talking about the extreme stereotype. Like we all know that, right? Like, oh, Christians are so close-minded. Everyone's close-minded to an extent, just based on what you're talking about. But every time someone starts to come negative to me about Christians, I always point it back to the fact that God is so loving and so good to even redeem people like that and even redeem people like me. What an amazing God, church, that we get to worship. We tend to want to be religious. And, and I know you're probably thinking, no, 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 I don't want to be religious. No, 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 this is, this is a human antidote. This is something that we do. We tend to want to be religious so that we won't feel guilty. 
when we've done bad things. You guys know what I'm talking about? We tend to want to be religious so we won't feel as guilty because we start to realize we don't have it all figured out, that we're not that great of people. And so what we'll do is maybe you've been out of church for a really long time and something bad happens or maybe even something good happens and the religious part of us starts to go, well, maybe I should go back to the church and put in some time with God. Maybe I should pay homage to a God that I've possibly created in my own mind. And if I do that, then I seem like a better person because I'm a churchgoer. I'm sure that this isn't for any of you, but this, I've dealt with this. And we tend to want to be religious to make ourselves feel better. But that's the point. We don't need to be religious. We don't need to pay homage to a God that we don't actually know. See, religion is about you. Relationship with Jesus is about him. You guys see what I'm saying? I can tell when someone's religious, they make it about them. It's so easy. It's like, booyah, got it. I'd name names, but, you know, we record this stuff. So, but religion is about you. Relationship with Jesus is about him. And it is this relationship that the world needs to learn about. Um, following Jesus is difficult. You guys agree with me on that one? And really, what a lot of people want is they just want a magic pill, a silver bullet, if you will. They want, oh, okay, so following Jesus, what do I do? So what they do is they run towards what seems easy, and they watch what Christians do. Well, it looks like you go to church, you put some money in some bag, which I just realized I forgot to go get. Um, could someone go get the bags from the... Yeah. And, uh, and we put money in the bags, we sing the songs... We do all these things that we think we're supposed to do, and then the world looks at that, and they start to go, well, that's what it looks like to be a Christian. We just monkey see, monkey do, and we don't even realize it. But let me, let me get practical what it means to daily follow Jesus. It means that you're going to daily trust him, that you're going to read the scripture and actually believe what he says, that you're going to submit to him and put into action the things that he tells you to do, and you're like, oh, I don't want to obey. Well, then you don't want a relationship with Jesus. Because having a relationship with Jesus means that maybe you don't do it perfectly, but you pursue doing what he says. And rather than a religion that focuses on duty or a religion that focuses on you not having guilt and appeasing a deity, but you actually have faith and you do what he says. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming forward toward him and said, Look! the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, I don't know if he said it that way, but I just want to put some tone in this. You guys know John Colburn, right? Like every once in a while, John, I run into him, or like we're at pizza, and he's like, Tim Riley! I'm like, oh, dude, relax. <laughs> kind of wonder if John the Baptist was a little like that in this moment. <laughs> Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was my Brian Regan impression. Um, <laughs> John uses the term lamb of God, which he's really denoting a sacrificial animal. And that would be very familiar to the Jews because the Jews would sacrifice a lamb on behalf of the nation of Israel all throughout the Old Testament. And John is now pointing physically to whom he believes is the Messiah, the one whom he believes he was unfit to even untie his sandals. And it is this Messiah that John the Baptist talks about. This anointed one that will take away the sin of the world, that will take away the effects that sin have on mankind if you would trust him. That death no longer has to have final say. This is good news, church. Woo, I need like, anyway. But the Lamb of God has come to be the sacrifice for us. This is the message that I wish people understood. Um, how many of you assume that at some point in your life you're going to die? Okay. I don't know what you people with your hands down are thinking, but all right. <laughs> I, I, Elijah, you know. <laughs> um, we, we, death and taxes, guys. Those are two things we can't get away from. And yet, because of what Jesus has accomplished, death does not have final say. Hallelujah. There's this verse, I talk about it a lot. I actually quote it a lot. I don't always quote where it is in the Bible. 
But it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And again, tattoo, this is the verse for me. Don't have one, but if I did. Paul says, God made him who had no sin, who had accomplished no sin, who had done no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This verse is balm to my soul. This verse encompasses what I wish every person in this room Every person in Santa Clara understood, not only knew about, but pledged allegiance to, that Jesus sacrificed for you and I, that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, and that Jesus is the one that took the death penalty for us. You ever thought about that? Even though we were found guilty, he wasn't. He took the death penalty for us. I don't know any more compelling, more beautiful a more important message than that one. If you haven't truly repented, I'm just, you know, real talk right now. I'll start. If you haven't really repented, if you haven't really had your heart broken over your sin, if you haven't crawled to Jesus in worship because you realize that he's willing to forgive you, I really wish you would because he's worthy. He's worthy of that worship. Verse 30. This is the one I meant, John is saying, when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Okay, Riddler. And we talked about this last week. John was Jesus' cousin. John was about six months older than Jesus as far as natural birth was concerned. But Jesus has surpassed. Jesus is above in rank because he has always been and will always be God incarnate. Verse 31, John the Baptist says, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. This does not mean that John didn't know his cousin. I'm pretty sure they knew each other. There's arguments about this, but I'm pretty sure he knew him. But he did not recognize him as the Messiah. He did not recognize Jesus as the anointed one until the time had come for Jesus to be revealed. So we're going to talk about this in John chapter 2 a ton, but I don't want you to miss this. We're going to see in John chapter 2 when Jesus and his mom have a conversation and she's like, hey, would you, turn, would you like do something about the wine because we're running out? And Jesus says, woman, which is an endearing term, my time has not yet come. <sighs> One thing I want you to understand is that God has a time and a place when certain things will be revealed and when they'll be understood. So that actually takes the uh, responsibility off of you to be the one to convert people. So stop trying to convert people. Share with them the goodness of Jesus Christ. Share with them the gospel. But don't think the results are up to you. The results are up to God. And the results of when God decided to reveal himself to Malik was up to God when he decided to do it. There were people praying for him. There were people talking to him. There were people probably annoying him with the gospel, if you will. Not that that ever happens. But God had a time and a place that it was revealed to him. The same was true of Kevin. The same was true of Carissa. The same was true of Scott. There was a time and a place that the gospel is revealed, and all of a sudden you can see God for who he is. Part of what we want to be about at this church is giving people the space and the opportunity to grow into the likeness of Jesus, to look like Jesus. But that is all about us being willing to progress, all about us being willing to put into action what God is teaching us. And as we do, we progress as we pursue the perfect one. That's what we're about. We progress as we pursue the perfect one. I understand things today that I didn't understand 10 years ago. So let's try this. Max, how old were you 10 years ago? 11. So do you know anything else now that maybe you didn't know back when you were 11? Probably a thousand times more. Absolutely. Um, Brittany, how old were you 10 years ago? 17. 17. You know more now as an adult woman than you did as a 17-year-old? Yeah. I understand things today as I write sermons that I did not understand 10 years ago. 
I was watching a sermon that, and I think I shared about this last week, but I was watching a sermon I did 10 years ago where I was an intern, and my, one of my mentors decided, hey, I'm going to have you preach in big church. That's what this is, just in case you're not used to Christian talk, um, big church. And I was preaching in big church, and I get up, and I'm skinny. I was like, eat a sandwich, bro. And, like, uh, and I get up, and I said, um, 37 times, which really annoyed me. And when I looked at the text, when I taught the text, and I get, to, I get to do this to myself, right? You don't do that. I'll do this. When I taught the text, I was so shallow. I would so skimmed over the point. I mean, the point's always Jesus. But, like, I really didn't dive into what was being said. And even though I listened to that sermon and I wanted to vomit, if I was honest, so please don't look at that sermon, <laughs> it reminded me today or last week actually in particular, that God's in the business of growing us. And so I'm not perfect by any means. You guys in 10 years will be like, 10 years ago, you were terrible. You probably wouldn't stay if I was that terrible. But but the thing is that we are growing as we pursue the perfect one. And the purpose of John's ministry was preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. And the Gospel of John tends to use the term Israel as a positive label for God's chosen people, identified ultimately by their beliefs, not their ancestry and their bloodline. So God came to show others at just the right time, Jesus came into which was his own to make a way for people to be redeemed. Verse 32. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Now, some of us probably know what he's talking about right here. In in Matthew and Luke, both gospel writers who write Matthew and Luke, respectively, they write these gospel additions, if you will, these explanations, the synoptic gospels with Mark, which are seen together. Matthew and Luke write about Jesus' baptism. And many of us know about Jesus' baptism, don't we? We've heard about it. It's Jesus comes down to the Jordan River where John the baptizer is, and he is baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sins. And Jesus comes to him, and what the other gospel writers say is that as he comes to him, John tries to deter him. And Jesus says what? Let it be so now. We do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented, baptized Jesus. And then what happened, church? As he comes out of the water, all of a sudden, the sky opens up. What looks like a dove comes down and rests upon him. And then something crazy, right? God the Father speaks. I I understand clouds being parted. I don't understand sky being opened, all right? And the sky is opened, and and the Lord God the Father, says, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased. That is a crazy story, isn't it? Look at John's edition. John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. That's it. That's all we get. (laughs) And Matthew and Luke give this much longer explanation, but what John is trying to point out to us is that the baptism of Jesus, not only did the Holy Spirit manifest himself through what looked like or was symbolized as a dove and rested on the anointed one, rested on the Messiah. It identified that he was who the Hebrew scriptures talked about. Verse 33, and I myself, John the Baptist says, did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. John the baptizer says, I did not recognize him until the Holy Spirit opened my mind, until the Holy Spirit identified Jesus as the Messiah. Even John the Baptist couldn't see it. And there is a time and a place that some will repent. So if you're praying for a friend and you're like, they just don't get it, they just don't care, keep praying. Your job's to be faithful. And there is a time and a place that some will repent, and when they repent, they're transformed. Maybe not perfectly, obviously, but they're transformed because their forward motion is no longer towards death, it's towards life. Because they've been made into a new creation, and like that, they will be made righteous. 
they will have justification. They will be made right before God. Yet, unless the Holy Spirit removes the veil, people just cannot see it. I want us to be a church that cares about those that are around us. I want us to be a church that cares about those around us who have not committed to Jesus Christ, but we have to make sure that when we share Jesus, it is the one from the scriptures, not one we've made up in our own minds, not one that we could control, not one that even we don't really understand, because how could we expect someone else to understand the Jesus that we claim we know if we don't understand him ourselves? It starts with us. So here's my question for you, church, and I want you to think about this. Is your heart submitted to Jesus Christ? Have you repented and handed over control to the God of the Bible? Or do you pay homage to a God you've created? Just so you'll feel less guilty every week. Ooh, that hurts. Verse 34. He closes this part with, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. In other translations, this is God's son. Jesus is God's chosen one, isn't he? He is God's only son. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. Look, the Lamb of God. So you don't have to misunderstand, Christians, that all that we do is about making much of Jesus. So if someone comes to you in his name, but doesn't recognize him as the word becoming flesh or as 100% God and 100% man at the same time, if they don't know him as Savior and Lord, do not listen to what they have to say. Because misinterpretations, misconceptions, and misunderstandings of Jesus and his glory are so easy. But eternity is at stake. Worship team, would you come on up? As you guys come on up, I'm going to just tell a really quick story. Thank you. Last Sunday after church, I was feeling pretty good, and um, I realized I needed a hobby. Like, church ministry shouldn't be my hobby. <laughs> I'm, like, more interesting than that. And, and so I, I decided I was going to pick up golf again. And I had played a little bit for the past few months, but I was like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this more often. And so I was looking at clubs, and I did like two days of just finding out everything I could know about clubs via the internet, because, you know, everything I need is there. And I'm looking at clubs and everything, and so I find where I could get some clubs that I want at Dick's Sporting Goods. And I was told, you never get a deal at Dick's Sporting Goods, but I'm here to tell you that's not true. And so, so I, I was going to go, and so I said to Lorelai, who if some of you are, uh, if we're friends on Facebook you've, or Instagram, you've seen uh, me post a picture of Lorelai hitting golf balls. She is a baller, all right? Any sport, she just picks it up, and she's awesome at it. And so, so I took her to Dick's Sporting Goods because I wanted to go find, I wanted to go find her clubs. <laughs> and, and so we went to the Sporting Goods place and we're looking, I talked with the golf guru. Anyway, super long story short, don't need to get into it. Got really good clubs for like 10% of what they were worth. All right, let's put it that way because they were returned, never used, just such a great deal. And as we were getting it, Lorelai was like at the place with me for like an hour and a half. So she was doing a lot of the rolling of her eyes. Come on, dad, da, da, da. But I had promised her that we were going to study the Bible together. And so after an hour of being at Dick's Sporting Goods, she was like, come on, Dad, are we going to study the Bible? Where are we going to go? And I'm like, ah, oh, relax, holy kid. And so we, I, I get the clubs, and then we jump in the car, and I text Aaron, and I'm like, hey, we're going to come back, but I think we're going to go hit balls. And she's like, oh, yeah, you can do that. All right, great, we're going to go to the driving range. But Laura, like, keeps going, hey, are we going to study the Bible? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And we go and hit balls, and, <coughs> excuse me. So then finally, we go home. And I show Erin the club, she doesn't care. And we start to have dinner. And after dinner, Lorelai comes to me and she goes, Dad, are you serious? I was like, what? She's like, are we gonna study the Bible? I was like, oh babe, I'm so sorry, yeah. Okay, let's go. And so we went to Pete's, right? So we go to Pete's, I walk in there, it's dark. I haven't been in a Pete's when it was dark, possibly yet, no, one time with Mike. And so like never been there at nighttime. And I see these baristas I haven't seen in like eight months. <laughs> Like, what, what What? are you doing here? Well, Lorelai wants to study the Bible. Oh, that's so cool. So we're sitting down. Lorelai's nine, by the way. And so we're discussing the Bible and we're talking. And I asked her this question. I said, hey, 
what do you believe? And she said, I'm not making up language here, right? I'm not putting on a pastor perspective. She said, well, Jesus is God, and he died for our sin, mine included, and he got what I deserve, and I get what he deserves. Dang, girl. That's true. She described the great exchange, which is a theological understanding of the fact that Jesus got what we deserve and we get what he deserves. But it's like, you're nine. All right, now we have the best children's ministry anywhere. I'm going to just keep saying that. And I'm not just saying it because my wife leads it, but it's awesome. Anyway, but this is evidence of this girl just being invested in, not just by her parents, but by the teachers and the other, you know, people that care that my kids would understand and your kids would understand who Jesus is. And on, on a Good Friday of 2014, we were at a church I was working at, and the lead pastor at the time was preaching, and he shared the gospel, and we were doing communion, and Lorelai grabs my hand when she's five, and she goes, uh, she goes, Dad, I want to take communion. And I go, babe, it's not snack. And she goes, no, I want to take communion because I believe in Jesus, and I want to show him I love him. And I was like, dang, girl. So I do that to her a lot. And so when I asked her, we started to talk about baptism. And I asked her, hey, do you want to get baptized? And she said, well, there's only one reason I don't want to get baptized. And I said, why? And she said, I don't know enough. (laughs) And so I was like, really? And so I showed her a video of someone in our community getting baptized. And I explained to her, hey, how long do you think that person had been a Christian? And she goes, like 10 years? I go, no, like one month. And Lorelai's mind exploded in that moment. And so we just started to talk, and we're still kind of wrestling with the idea of baptism, but I explained to her, no, Lorelai, you know plenty. It's all about loving Jesus and outwardly showing what you believe inwardly, and the only question that really matters is, why wouldn't you get baptized if you love him? And so we prayed together, and I said, Lorelai, you start, and I'll tell you what, man, that girl, she starts to pray, and she did, John Colvin does this too, it's cute. Uh, What she did was, she goes, she starts to pray to God, and then she starts to talk about God to me which is cute. And, and so she was kind of doing this thing. And then, but then she said, and God, I thank you for a dad who wants to make sure that I know Jesus better. And I just started bawling. But I'm reminded that as your pastor, I want the same thing for you, that I just want you to know Jesus better. I, want, I don't want you to know, just know about him. I want you to recognize his, how supreme he is and actually put into action the things that God is asking you to do.